Thank you all for uh, being here. I'm and uh, sticking with us through this third panel here today. I'm Sam Skolnick. I'm a senior reporter uh, with the Federal Contracts Report here at uh, Bloomberg Government slash Bloomberg BNA. Uh, it's my first time uh, hosting one of these shindigs, so thank you in advance for bearing with me. Um, so to the degree uh, that there is a strong nexus between program management improvement efforts and acquisition reform, there's no segment uh, that's clearly more directed, uh, impacted more directly than federal contractors, than industry. So uh, I, I wanted to talk uh, about that and specifically delve a little bit deeper into uh, the bill that was passed uh, that uh, PMI and others had worked uh, on for a very long time, various iterations of it, the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act, signed into law last uh, December. So before we begin with the questions, why don't we have uh, these three fine panelists introduce themselves, please. Rob, why don't we start with you? I'm Rob Burton. I'm a partner at the Kroll and Mooring Law Firm here in Washington. I did serve in the federal government. I was at OMB. I was the deputy and acting administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy for a number of years. So I'm Dan Shannock. I'm the executive director of the IBM Center for the Business of Government. I, too, am an OMB alum. I was a, the chief of information policy and technology, which is now the portfolio handled by the Office of the Federal Chief Information Officer. I also chair a panel at the National Academy of Public Administration that's taking a look at the implementation of the PMIA, uh, and I'm happy to talk in that capacity as well. Um, my name is Alan Baludas. I'm with Cisco Systems. Uh, unlike my two distinguished uh, colleagues, I had a real job in government. Um, I was at the Department of Commerce and served as their head of management and budget and their first chief information officer. Thank you, guys. Um, so, Rob, why don't I start with you? To the degree, to during this time that I've been on the beat here covering federal contracting and procurement policy about the last year and a half, um, I've consistently heard from industry groups about their concerns uh, about the need for acquisition reform, that the process is uh, too slow to sell goods and services uh, to the government, uh, that when talking about IT, that there are particular concerns that equipment is outdated, uh, that you have cybersecurity concerns, which ultimately are national security concerns. So I, I guess what I'd love to hear from you is, um, I know that you've been working on a program management improvement bill for a long time. Uh, why don't you talk specifically about how industry is uh, going to be helped uh, by this bill? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's exciting, quite frankly, and it's uh, in my view, this legislation is one of the most significant acquisition reform pieces of legislation in the last 10, 15 years, and it is acquisition reform. Program management, as you know, is part of acquisition. I think Barry Berkowitz put it very well about the big A. It is part of acquisition. Some people don't uh, get that fundamental uh, basic precept, but that's very important to understand. It is part of acquisition. This is acquisition reform legislation, and industry is quite happy with it because one of the frustrating things for industry, Sam, is that the government does not do program management well. It doesn't do it well. The requirements are ill-defined. I think some of the other panelists talk about, talked about this fundamental point. I think Mr. Cooper made this point as well. Uh, the requirements have to be defined well or industry can't perform well. And what you're going to have are people like me, the lawyers coming in after the fact, uh, with all sorts of legal disputes, all of this can be avoided, at least to a large degree, if the requirements are done well. So if program management is improved, the requirements will be improved as well. They go sort of hand in hand. And I think this legislation will drive over time the improvement of contract requirements which will improve the management of the program. I mean, it all is very related. And one thing, Sam, that has not been discussed, which is very fundamental, I want to make sure this point is made, the government does not have any standards. Industry has standards. Industry works to these common standards. And there's standards about how to keep a project on time within budget. They're very elementary, quite frankly. The government doesn't have them. They're usually referred to in the private sector as ANSI standards. Uh, ANSI standards show up in the federal acquisition regulation here and there, but not in program management. This, the law requires that the government basically get some standards, and I think industry's hope is, why don't you use the same ones that we use, because then we can talk the same language, and then your programs are going to run better because we're all on the same sheet of music. This is so fundamental, I can't stress it enough, but these standards have got to be used by the government. I think then everything will flow much better. That feeds really well into the next question that I'd like to uh, broach 
with Dan, uh, talking about these standards and about best practices generally, mm -hmm. uh, what the government can learn from industry in terms of improving program management, um, in terms of speeding the process along and working better with uh, acquisition officials in the process. Sure. Well, um, in fact, the, the uh, host of today's event is also working with the NAPA panel, PMI, and they've done some real ter terrific work on this topic, both in the private and public sectors. And what, one of the things that the NAPA study team, many of them are here as well in the panel, have, have learned is that this is really sort of a continuum from the government's work on project management, which many in this room, as I look around, have been involved in, in many projects across a number of different agencies, into sort of a higher order level of program management, which was, the statute was passed intending to sort of draw this line from keeping projects moving and meeting cost schedule and performance goals to thinking about best practices for managing large, complex transformation initiatives, which require the skills of project management, but also bring projects together in a sort of a change mode, which requires skills uh, uh, and best practices that include managing up and across teams, managing across organizations, dealing with the press, dealing with third-party organizations, dealing with Congress and oversight. Uh, these sort of softer skills are critical best practices for program management. Think about stakeholder management or change management in the private sector that government brings in very well in some cases, not so well in others. And part of the promise of the statute is to create the set of standards, as Rob talked about, and draw from that to create a more consistent treatment of these key program management assets as the government moves forward and, tr and achieves transformation in, in a number of different areas. Thank you, Dan. Um, Alan, I'd like to talk, so all morning we've been talking about uh, project management, uh, what project managers do, but maybe not to as specific a degree uh, as might be helpful for some of the audience who have more of a, an acquisition focus directly as opposed to a project management focus. So could you talk, define just a little bit uh, what it is that project managers do, who they are in the federal sort of woodwork, and how they interact with uh, contract officers and others throughout the acquisition process. Yeah, well, uh, I'd, to answer that, I'll, I'll springboard a little bit from the statements of my two um, distinguished colleagues, and, and that is, um, and, and pick up on some points from the earlier panel, we uh, did a survey of num a number of years ago, I think with PMI, and, um, and the Council for Excellence. Yeah. Council, uh, to date how far uh, ago it was. And we asked who are the project managers or program managers in, in government. And we did get, as Barry did, um, he mentioned his experience at the Department of Commerce, thousands of responses. And it turned out it was largely the group of analysts who were responding uh, and reporting back on, on the part um, uh, uh, initiative, which to me is like far from being a program manager. Program management is distinct, in my view, from project management. It, it may involve uh, several projects. It, it has components of uh, acquisition and IT and HR and budget and finance, but it is not singly uh, any one of those, so I'd probably take issue with, uh, with Rob that it's somehow an element of uh, acquisition management. If it becomes that as part of the implementation in the law, uh, God take pity on us. Um, and, um, but I, I think it involves multiple disciplines, uh, and I think uh, the, it, that's one of the major purposes of the legislation to call this out as a separate uh, role, responsibility, and discipline in government where someone is very did, works their way up to running a major program, having run individual projects, smaller programs, till he or she is taking on responsibilities for whether it be uh, the decennial census, a major weapon system, a huge construction project, or a major IT initiative in government where as you know, we spend a hundred plus billion dollars a year on IT, and a uh, uh, hundred projects across government make up 57 percent of that a hundred plus billion dollars. Thanks very much. 
Um, so, uh, Rob, do you have any uh, responses to that, just in terms of the the, the nexus between? Program you do a management? point counterpoint. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not looking slot, to start a cage you know. match here or anything like that. But I'm just wondering, uh, you know, any any response to Alan on that? Or well, actually, yeah, I agree with Alan on one specific uh, point. Um, it, it's, uh, it's usually that I better do, <laughs> better than I usually do. Right, right? that's pretty good. The, uh, this is fundamental, though, because nobody knows who the program and project managers are in the mm -hmm. federal government. So this goes to one of the main reasons for the legislation, um, that, that government create a professional workforce that can be identified for training purposes and so forth. I was talking to one senior procurement executive in an agency, and they said, look, Rob, I have no idea who the project and program managers are in this agency. So uh, it's really hard for me to, to talk about training them and so forth because we, don't, we really don't know who they are. Uh, because there's not a professional series that everybody migrates to. They're all over the place. I think uh, FAI did a study. 41% of program and project managers were in a job series called Other. Uh, you, you know, you're kidding me? I mean, I think that sort of says it all, right? I mean, that, says, that talks about the challenge that the federal government has here. This legislation is directed to have OPM actually create a job series and a, a career path that is dedicated to program project managers. I was speaking at a DHS event and somebody from the audience said, you know, this legislation is very important to us because for the first time, we're actually viewed as important. We're actually viewed as having an important role in federal acquisition. And this is, this is critical uh, that we be viewed as a profession and not just an administrative position. We went through the same thing with the procurement workforce years ago, uh, but now I think it is more professionalized. You have the 1102 job series, so if you say to me I'm at 1102, I sort of know what you do. I sort of know just when you tell me you're in 1102, I have a pretty good idea. Program project management is all over the place. And I think this is where you're, it's different from the private sector. In the private sector and corporations, those people are well identified and they're vi viewed as key players in the mission of the corporation. And so I think the government just needs to follow that, uh, that model. Um, two, two points just to add on sure. to that. One is, in addition, the training element in government for project management, fairly well defined, in fact, PPM, DIWEA, other courses like that. There's, there's training that, that many people in government and industry have benefited from. Um, and there's not a similar level of understanding of sort of how do you give the higher level executive training, executive skills, and part of the statute's promise is to try to set out um, skill sets and competencies that would be part of that curriculum. The second is to Alan's point, um, I think if you think about big A acquisition as, as leading across the life cycle of a program, and it's really how you define sort of where does acquisition start and stop. The program manager, I think the last um, panel talked very well, Barry talked very well about this, about the left side of the, the model. I'd also look to the right side. Um, Steve Kelman and I uh, wrote a, a piece last year called, I think the name was something like post-award contract management where the acquisition rubber meets the performance road. And, and the point is that the program manager really has to carry through that entire life cycle. Thanks. Um, so I have a kind of a broad question for, I'd like to get each of your responses uh, to it. And it has to do going back to the law that was passed, um, the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act. <clears throat> um, and what the challenges are gonna be in implementing it going looking forward. Uh, one of the panelists before, um, I apologize, I forgot who that was, but noted uh, that the OMB uh, Deputy Director for Management has still yet to be appointed. Uh, that's not the only uh, official really important in acquisition world that still has yet to uh, be named. So uh, it, business doesn't know, for example, who's going to lead GSA, uh, and they don't know who's going to run the Office of Federal Procurement Policy as well. So uh, the challenge is for implementing this law, for uh, basically making it as effective as it can be uh, going forward. Why don't we uh, start with you, Dan, and then Alan, and then we'll end with Rob. So first of all, there's a very talented set of leaders in government now who are working on the implementation of the statute. The, the acting director at OMB, the acting Dep deputy De for management, uh, Dustin Brown, uh, a phenomenal career, career executive. Uh, he's got a terrific team uh, working at this, and the, the team at, as we and the, and the study team uh, at Napa have worked with OPM, there's a lot of focus on the statute and, and how do you implement it effectively. So I think that as the last panel talked about, there's, there's progress being made. Um, some of the challenges, I think, are more sort of the traditional challenges of programs at a large scale and ch and that involve change necessarily cut across organizational boundaries 
And those boundaries are really funded and they're authorized and they have constituencies that map to those individual lanes. But if you've got a large complex change initiative across large agencies like DHS or HHS um, you'll, or commerce, you'll, you'll necessarily see sort of cross-organizational um, elements of that, of that program and that change. And those are, as we all know, hard, hard to fight against. And so a, a skilled program manager kind of builds that constituency and builds that stakeholder map and, and sets in motion a change strategy to move across that playing field and achieve the goals of, and objectives bringing all the different players around. That's hard to do. That's one of the main challenges that I would see in implementation of the, of the discipline. Yeah, and and I'd, I'll second uh, Dan's point. There are uh, an array of very capable seasoned career executives uh, across government and you know and be playing those ro these important management roles uh, but a number of the key jobs as you noted are vacant not only the uh, deputy director for management but the CIO the CFO the uh, head of OFPP I think the only positions where I've heard anybody identified as the OIRA head and uh, a nominee uh, put forward to head the Office, uh, office of Personnel Management. Um, but of course, the DDM was not going to write the guidance to, to, to begin with. He or she was only going to sign off on it at the, uh, uh, at, at the tail end. I think the uh, kind of the key pieces in the implementation uh, may be the following, and, and it gets us into a topic that I know you want to come back to, which is a role for industry or how industry could contribute. One, I, I think, um, is we need more success stories about how major programs have been implemented. If you look at the literature, whether it's the academic literature or the things that are on the trade press or from GAO or IG, they really all focus on the programs that are over budget, behind schedule, and not delivering the promised functionality. Pete Marwick years ago uh, coined a term for these. They, they called them runaway systems. Um, but so we know what not to do. We know all the wrong things, but we don't have many success stories and good practices we can point to that we could build into a program management curricula and say these are the things we, what, uh, we should be doing and we should be teaching people to succeed. I've likened it in the past to like studying medicine by only doing autopsies. Um, secondly, I, I think, um, I think industry can help identify when we're off to a bad start. Uh, Rob touched on this, I think, a little bit in his opening remarks, but there are several key phases that any sound program needs to go through. The uh, guidance given to a program manager in the past, because I've played this role on several initiatives, is make it happen. You know. You, you got to pull this through. And, and what I'd suggest you look at when you go back to the office, either today or tomorrow, is Google uh, uh, a, a talk by the late Professor Jerry Harvey of George Washington University. It's called The Abilene Paradox. A and those of you who either are in or have spent some time in government, or even those of you who've worked with government projects from industry, we'll find some things that really resonate um, uh, with you. I have some other ideas, but I know um, I, d I don't want to keep us from hearing from, uh, from Rob, so I'll turn it back to, to, to him. So let me, let me just say, Sam, that um, I think that the, this, this legislation is a gift to the Trump administration. I believe that the politicals, when they come in, are going to very much embrace it. Because all the themes of this legislation go right in line with the Trump administration. How many times has this president said, uh, or at least tweeted, you know, we want to see projects, you know, on time or ahead of schedule. I believe he says ahead of schedule under budget, ahead of schedule under budget. How many times have we heard that? And that's what all this, this legislation is all about. I mean, this is all about increasing the efficiency of government programs. And that's all the federal government does is run programs and projects. And so 
I think that uh, the Trump administration is going to latch on to this, especially when they see an Accenture study that was done that indicated that if you increased efficiency of government programs by just 1%, that that would arguably result in savings to the government of a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. So just imagine if the president said, let's go for two. You know, let's go for 2%. It's almost enough uh, to build a wall. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and remove the deficit, by the way. And so, I mean, I think that's absolutely huge. And don't underestimate these career executives at OMB. I mean, they are taking a leadership role. They are moving out with this legislation. And the agencies are also enthusiastic about this uh, legislation. And a lot of them have already started putting in place their implementation plans. So the politicals, I think, are going to be the winners here because they're going to inherit all of this as they walk in. And I think they'll take credit for it. I would. Um, you know, say this was uh, this was my idea, you know, and I think uh, I think you're going to see that quite frankly. Um, but I think it's, it's a, it, the challenge is going to be the internal bureaucracy of the government, which uh, no political can do much about. So one of the problems at OMB is that there is no office of program management policy. There really is no one that actually can inherit this easily. Because, and I think that's one of the reasons for the legislation. Who at OMB, at the highest levels, really have this in their portfolio? And the answer is no one currently. It's all a little piece here and there. Uh, no concentrated, uniform, focused, effort on pro uh, program management policy at the OMB level. That's a problem. And then the other problem will be trying to get a new job series through OPM. That will not be easy. OPM moves very slowly. And so I think people will get a little frustrated. My advice to the folks at OMB, though, is to reach out to industry, identify these best practices. How does industry do it? You know, how does industry do it? How can the government and industry work together to actually improve program management. I think that should be the focus at OMB right now. Uh, just two points uh, sure. in, uh, to add on to Rob. Uh, number one, I know that OMB does have a team that's working this, um, and they have reached out to industry. They've certainly reached out and talked to, to NAPA and to other industry groups. So I think that they are focused in that area. The other is, uh, just in terms of the bipartisan nature of the legislation, per your earlier comment, this really was the product of members of Congress from both parties, and I believe was signed into law both in the houses. previous administration. Both um, uh, so this really is bipartisan good government yeah. uh, going forward. So before we get to questions from the audience, I definitely want to leave some time for that. I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, Rob said, um, sort of looking forward, agency implementation plans. Um, can you talk just a little bit more about that, to, uh, which agencies and are these plans sort of up to snuff in terms of um, what, what they should include? Well, I don't know. I haven't. I mean, I'm not uh, terribly uh, versed on uh, the the actual d details of the plans. My, I'm excited because they're actually thinking about it. Uh, usually, and having been at OMB, until OMB actually says do this, do that, a lot of agencies just are shy to take a leadership role. Uh, in this area, I was somewhat struck by the fact that they were moving out before OMB. I thought, well, wow, you know, that's a little different. And so, the mere fact that they're actually thinking about it, I think, is uh, is just huge. It could can I, th can I yes. add to that? I, and I think that's a po very positive thing. I, I think in our previous panel, both the individuals, leaders from um, HHS and Commerce noted the actions they were already taken. I think Dan and I were um, part of an event at the Department of Veterans Affairs where they were already bringing their first class of, uh, of program managers through. I think this demonstrates how important this issue is to everybody because one of the major drivers of this years ago was when we look at kind of why projects fail, it, it, it wasn't because of the, um, wasn't because of the IT, um, you know, people argue sometimes it's the challenges of the budget process, but the last time we had a budget enacted across government, um, at the start of the fiscal year was 1997, it's 20 years ago, so if you haven't learned to kind of manage through that process by this time year. So it, 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 it fell to like, it's, it's really just management. Uh, it's some, a very fundamental, important and key thing, but it's hard to focus on in a period where everybody seems to want to be a kind of change agent, uh, catalyst, a leader, a synthesizer, 
a former Silicon Valley entrepreneur who's going to drop by government for a year. You know, nobody wants to be a manager because management is hard if you've, if you've done it. Management is hard, and it's, uh, it, it, usually you only, only learn it not only going through the certifications, but by getting cut yourself kind of badly bruised and beaten up in, in, in carrying initiatives through government through to fruition. Thanks very much. Uh, we have time just for a question or two. I see right in the front row. That's you, sir. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you very much. We have, well, we're, <laughs> thank you. Hi, uh, Neil Albert with uh, NFA Consulting. To Rob and Alan's point, one of the things, um, I've been on the Defense Business Board for about 17 years, and one of the things that we did in a lot of project, ma project management looking at was determine what was the problem with the program managers of the Department of Defense, because they aren't are all real great in many cases, even though we'd like to believe that's the case. But we found out that one of the things that's happening is that many of these folks are career uh, government folks. They're either military or civilian and been in that for a long time, and they really don't have the knowledge of what industry is doing. They have an understanding of what their accomplishments are, but they've never been on the other side to see how industry actually works. And that's one of the biggest problems is the fact that they're sitting across the table from people in program management who have a better understanding of what, what, how cost is created, what the overheads mean, things like that. And um, I think one of the things that we should come out of this from an industry perspective is hopefully getting industry to allow these folks to come to them and learn that and take a year or two mm -hmm. to be in the industry side. As part of this whole PMIAA, I think that ought to be one of those requirements that go in there because otherwise, if you don't have that experience, you really are kind of at a disadvantage. Yeah, and Cameron alluded to this in his very opening remarks, and that is you have people on the government side who are doing this once mainly main, or, or often only for the first time, and you have industry people who have a, a broad array of experience. And, and the other thing is, in government, we often uh, promote people because they've done a good job in their specific area. I, I took over three major programs in the Department of Commerce, which were all failing, and part of my first actions, which endeared me, tremendously throughout the department is I removed every one of the people who was running the program. One, a distinguished statistician at the decennial census, one a patent attorney at the patent office, and one a meteorologist at the weather service, because I didn't think they knew shit about running a program. But <laughs> they'd be the person I'd go to for legal counsel on my patent and trademark. But you know, that's why I think this discipline is so important. Thank you. Uh, what, one, other, sure. one, the, one of the areas that the study that we're working on out of NAPA will address is that very point. How do you develop both the career path internally, but then how do, what are best practices and effective ways to bring in external talent um, as well? So I think we have time just for one more question. This is a gentleman in the back. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, Folks, uh, sorry if you have to strain your neck. Um, thanks, Dan and Rob. Uh, my name's Adam Lipton. I'm from OMB. And I just wanted to kind of heard our name mentioned quite a bit. As you know, PMIAA has some requirements for, uh, for the DDM. I actually work for Dustin Brown, who is the acting DDM. And uh, across OMB, we are engaged. Uh, we are working across, as you know, um, this program management, a lot of the concepts discussed here, um, stre stretches the vastness of the federal enterprise and across communities. So. Um, it seems like uh, some folks have um, had interactions with us, others haven't. Um, but I did just want to mention and, and did want to say again, thanks to Rob and Dan, that um, OMB is working on, um, working on an implementation approach. We're on track to have the guidance out for December, um, you know, and, and how agencies, it's, it's, um, we've, we've talked with a lot of agencies and know that they have already had a lot of um, practices in place regarding program management just from building up this expertise over the years and, and looking to leverage those as, as we get ready to kind of build out a full maturity over 
the next uh, few years for what program management, how we can share best practices with industry, the getting nailing down uh, the roles and responsibilities of the PMIO and how the council can best engage uh, across agencies and with the private sector. So um, thank you to the folks at Bloomberg and to the panel just to give me a few minutes to um, clarify that OMB is working on this um, and happy to chat with anyone um, uh, if, if you like. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. I think we're over time. Uh, so uh, hopefully not over budget, uh, but thank uh, you. <laughs> and uh, cheers. <clears throat>